Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Before the break, Kim suggested that this issue of a lack of school choice options in many rural areas is kind of a chicken and egg problem. And I guess I would second that. And I would point to a Texas Tribune article. Here's the headline. Private schools are ready to expand into smaller communities if Texas adopts voucher programs. Talking about the desire of these kinds of schools, one at the top of the story is Promise Academy, a Christian private school in Northern Tyler. The ability of these schools to expand would be only heightened if parents were allowed to take that state money that is currently going to the public school to educate their children, put it in an educational savings account, and take it to another option. It would provide a financial incentive to open these kinds of other alternatives that might serve some families and some children, some students, better than the government monopoly. And Colin, the other argument that I hear from these rural Republicans who are opposed to these kinds of ideas, these kinds of policy proposals, is that the local school district plays kind of a central social role in those communities. It's the Friday Night Lights argument that the whole town sort of revolves around what's happening at the school. You see everyone at the games. There are not private schools that are competing with that, and we don't have the population base. We don't have the affluence to support that kind of thing. And I guess I'm stumped by that argument because if the people really feel that way, then having other alternatives available to people wouldn't matter because the same families and the same students would choose the local school that they love, even if they had the option of taking an educational savings account. But on the other hand, It might let out a few people who are unsatisfied with the local government monopoly for whatever reason. And I don't see how it helps to trap people in the public school system who aren't satisfied. And by the way, if everybody is satisfied, then what would vouchers matter? I absolutely agree with that, Kyle. You know, as we talk about the Friday Night Lights argument, I think that's a pretty good image, actually. And I think within that image, you have to understand that in a small town, with a public school that is a center of community, the school superintendent is a big political player. And I think as we look at these rural Republicans who are siding with Democrats against these educational savings accounts, it has a lot to do, I think, with their ability to go back to these rural district superintendents and say, hey, look, I supported you here. I'm not voting for the educational programs that would threaten any monopoly that your public school has in that district. But the other thing that is important here is, you know, we talked a little bit about how in Illinois, there's been so much more public money flowing to public schools during the course of the Invest in Kids scholarship program. And one of the things that I think Governor Abbott has done very well, and Texas is doing well in proposing this program, is saying, look, this doesn't have to be an either or situation. More than one thing can be true at the same time. And we can increase funding for public education, which this bill would do. And we also, by the way, will add the sweetener of $4,000 extra for teacher salaries and put that out there along with the school choice program. So if they go a second round and they come back and say, okay, you know, through the state Senate puts the school choice back in, they can go back to their districts and say, hey, look, we fought the good fight, but do you really want to give up all this public money? My back's to the wall here. And besides, we'll get more money for the teachers. So in terms of the politics of it, I'm hopeful that that is one way it could But the reporting today seems to suggest that the intent of the House is to take out the school choice program and then pass all of the increased teacher pay and so forth. And let's listen to a clip of Governor Greg Abbott. This is a press conference last week suggesting that that kind of a package without his school choice program might not be able to pass the Senate and certainly would not get over his veto pen. Uh, Has people back home could be families, it could be kids, it could be educators uh, who want to see this legislation passed because this legislation is going to benefit the voters and the the residents uh, in each of uh, the House members' districts. But another thing I know about the House, and and they they know me well enough uh, to know that if if they were to do something like that, for, for one, 
it, it probably wouldn't even meet with agreement from the Senate. It would be nothing that would ever meet my desk. But if, if it did, of course, I would just have to veto it. We would start all over again. We'd be, we'd be spending uh, December here, maybe January here, maybe February here. And I know one thing about both the House and Senate, they want to get out of here. Uh, and, uh, but they, they can get out of here in a way that truly does deliver. Kim, you were giving credit to Governor Abbott a moment ago. Do you think that he will follow through on that promise? Or maybe it's a threat that if you don't pass the school choice program that the governor and the Speaker of the House have discussed and something similar has already passed the Senate, that we'll just bring you back for another special session and then maybe another one after that. He's certainly followed through up until now, as noted, that this is, I think, the fourth special session that they are in. And I think that that might be a very effective threat because, yeah, covering Washington, D.C., I can tell you one of the greatest motivators always is simply being able to get out of town. Sometimes it's the only reason anything happens. I think the other thing that Abbott has on his side, and it's why you hear him being so aggressive about this, is public sentiment. You know, this is something that is supported by many Republicans, even a lot of Democratic constituents, despite the fact that Democratic lawmakers are voting against this in in great numbers. It's as popular in Texas as it is in other places. So he knows he has a winning issue. And, you know, I would note that the threat of holding people in the threat of primaries against these folks ought to be something that the holdouts take very seriously. We had an example of this in the last couple of years where a similar situation in Iowa, where a number of Republican rural holdouts refused to get on board with Governor Kim Reynolds's school choice initiative. She went out and campaigned against them and supported alternatives to them in a primary, and she largely got her candidates over the finish line and as a result was able to pass her school choice program. Those folks lost their jobs. It's not difficult to imagine something similar maybe happening here because, again, while many of these guys are bending the knee to the local superintendent and school choice is a little less cut and dry in some of these rural areas, there's a lot of folks in the base who still believe in it in principle, and that's where the primary vote matters. Whatever happens, though, in Texas, it still seems like it has been a banner year for school choice bills. Here is a list of states that have passed something in 2023. I'm getting this from the Washington Examiner. Iowa, Utah, Arkansas, Florida, Oklahoma, Ohio, South Carolina, Indiana, Nebraska, and Montana. So it is clear to me, at least, which way the policy winds are blowing among conservatives and Republicans. And it may take longer than this session or the next session for Texas to join them. But if these programs work, Colin, it's something that the success will spread and parents will be demanding better options. And the other important thing to underline again is that in some of these states, They are not passing small school choice programs. They're passing universal school choice available to any family that wants it. And so the policy effect of that as those programs get implemented and unfold is not going to be small and not going to be missable to people paying attention nationwide. That's right. I mean, parents have always been the strongest advocates for this. They see the results every day with their kids coming home from school. And frankly, they see it at the dinner table. They see it talking to their friends, especially for families that are in more low-income neighborhoods. They know very well what the public option is providing. They can see the numbers. They know the environment. And they know the opportunities that these programs are providing for their kids. That's why they exist. That's why they're expanding. It's beyond just an ideological battle of whether or not parents should have the choice, but it's the actual value that these programs are providing to families that make them such a sell across ideological lines. And as Kim said earlier, the only real contingent that you have opposed to these programs at this point are Democratic elites who are you know, entrenched in fighting with the teachers unions to preserve this as a public school monopoly at the expense of kids. Thank you, Colin and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we will be back next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.